come worship you in spirit and in truth. Dear God, there's many upon our hearts today that stand in need of prayer. Lord, we lift each one up to you in a special way. Those that are, have upcoming uh, procedures done, those that are undergoing treatments, those that have been uh, given not so good news on their health, God, we just ask you to comfort them and give them peace as only you can. Lord, we may you will give their body and return to an after state of health. Dear God, we ask you to be those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost these precious babies. Dear God, just to comfort them and bring them peace. Dear Lord, continue to be with us here at Fourth Street to help us to worship you in a way and a manner that's well and pleasing in your sight always. Dear God, be with uh, our servicemen and women on the sea fighting for our freedom. God, we lift them up to you each day. Bring them home safely and soon to your will. Dear God, just continue to be the leader of our country to help them make decisions that will be pleasing unto you. They want you for guidance and all that they do. And dear God, we ask you to forgive us when we sin. We fall short way too often, Lord, and we just ask you to forgive us. Lord, just help us with us throughout this worship service. Let us uh, clear, clear our mind of all the world with thoughts as we focus upon you, upon your son Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made for our sins. And we thank you, we love you, and we pray you. We give you grace and mercy in your God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> We're using a song book this morning. It's turn number 226. We're going to sing a song about every lesson. Ephesians 1 3 reminds us, praise be to God who has blessed us. Come up, Oh, 
There are collection baskets up front in the foyer for those who wish to donate to the work of the church. Let us pray for them. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet together this day in this building. And we're grateful to live in a country where we can worship thee according to the dictates of our conscience and not worry about persecution or strife. Bless us that we might share with one another our abundance and give so that others may be blessed. We pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody out this morning. It's a beautiful day. So glad that you're here to worship God together. Thank you so much for that song service, Robert, John, for a communion service. Noel, for that very thoughtful prayer. Appreciate so much our uh, worship leaders and all that you do here. So thankful for you. So thankful for this congregation. Uh, it's great to be a part of 4th Street Church of Christ. And, and uh, we welcome uh, Daniel and Katie here as well. We're so thankful that you guys are here. We're thankful for any of you who may be visiting today. Uh, if this is your first time and you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop and talk to any of us. And we hope to have you again at some other point in time. When Christian Herter was governor of Massachusetts, Christian Herter was his name. When Christian Herter was governor of Massachusetts, he was running hard for a second term in office. He was doing everything he could to get a second term in office. And one day, after a really busy morning chasing folks and no lunch, he arrived at a church barbecue. It was late afternoon, and Herder, he was just starving. He was just starving so badly. And as Herder moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving chicken. She put a piece on his plate, and then she turned to the next person in line, and then Governor Herder said, Excuse me, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? And the woman said, I'm Sorry, I'm supposed to get one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said, only one to a customer. Governor Herder was a modest and a very unassuming man, but he decided, you know, for right now, I'm just going to throw my weight around a little bit. And he said to that woman, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. And she said, do you know who I am? She said, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Can you move along, mister? <laughs> I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Now, we're not going to look at who's in charge of the chicken today, but we're going to ask, who is in charge of my life? As far as my life is concerned, and as far as your life is concerned, we need to ask that question if we are followers of Christ, who is really in charge? Now we can say in theory all day long, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is in charge of my life, but when it comes to our actions, <coughs> is that true? Does that hold true in our everyday lives? Now who do we say Jesus is based upon what we have studied so far? Now who Jesus is based upon what we have studied so far, those details are given to you, provided for you on the discussion sheets that you have and we will see those things as we continue to study. But we're going to build on these details about who Jesus is because we really want to know. And as the Logos, Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus always will be. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God and the Word was God. And that is Jesus Christ. And then we notice here, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Scripture says, Paul wrote, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now we see it there in that passage, don't we? Jesus Christ is Lord. Many scholars call Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, or Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11, they call that the Christ Him. They call that the Christ Him. So many people believe that Philippians 2, 5 through 11 was a worship song that was sung by the early Christians. And many teachers say Paul included it because he wanted to speak to the church at Philippi and he wanted them to sing these words, he wanted them to sing these details because they were getting too caught up in the culture around them. A culture that put political leaders like emperors 
up on a pedestal. And so the emperors, we see that emperors were actually worshipped. They were worshipped as celebrities. They were worshipped as gods. And so many of the emperors called themselves sons of God. And so the culture was filled with people who were all about their social status. People who were all about their image. And people who were all about their things. And these people were so focused on themselves and that mindset that what did we start to notice? What did Paul notice? That it was seeping, it was seeking and finding a way into the church of Philippi. And so to help pull the Christians away from their fascination with the culture, Paul shares, Paul writes this Christ hymn. And many teachers say, you know what's going on here? They say it's a side-by-side -side comparison between Nero and Jesus. Now, I know Nero's not mentioned here, the emperor's not mentioned, but they say it's, it's a contrast between a false leader, a false lord, Nero, and Jesus, a true lord, the true lord, Jesus Christ. Because what we do notice is Jesus, according to this passage, Jesus humbled himself as a servant. He humbled himself, even though he was the son of God. The emperor, on the other hand, he was out in the culture around the people at Philippi, and he was out there exalting himself as Lord, as a son of God, as a celebrity. So maybe, I don't know, maybe one of the things that Paul wanted to do was show the differences between a false Lord and a real Lord. It's not there in the text, but it could have been there in, an, in a way that is implied. And so we do come away from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, learning the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want us to know this. Saying that Jesus Christ is Lord is not exactly the same thing as saying that Jesus is God. Saying that Jesus Christ is Lord is not exactly the same thing as saying that Jesus is God. Now Thomas is one of the people in Scripture that teaches us there is there's a difference. I mean, they overlap in some ways, but there is a difference. Notice what Thomas said. He said, my Lord... My God. Jesus is God. He is divine. But He is also Lord. And you see, the Lordship of Jesus is one of the Bible's most significant teachings. We have seen that Jesus is God. He's part of the Godhead. The exact representation of God the Father. And there is a Greek word for Lord in the Bible... And the first place that I ever heard this Greek word was not in a Bible class, was not in a sermon, but on the radio when I was a teenager. The first time I ever heard this Greek word for Lord was on the radio when I was a teenager. One thing over the past several years, I've talked to several college students, I've talked to several young people, and they've said things like this. The 80s had the best music. And I looked at them and said, your parents have raised you well. <laughs> and I disagreed with them. But the first place where I ever heard this Greek word for Lord was on the radio. And when this song came on the radio, I would flip that volume button all the way up. And I would breathe in deep. And I would just belt that song out. I didn't care who was looking. The main thing I loved about that song were the, the great strong vocal harmonies. And the funny thing is, I had no idea the song was making a reference to the Lord. But here's the song, a song by a group called Mr. Mystery. Kiri. Kiri is Kiri a liaison. Kiri a liaison. Kurios. Kurios is the Greek word for Lord. So when I was singing this song, Kiri a liaison, I didn't realize what I was singing was, Lord, have mercy. When I was belting it out in my truck having a car concert, I was singing, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on this road that I'm traveling down. Lord, have mercy on this life that I am living. That's what the song was saying. But we see the term Lord is that Greek word, 
kurios. And there are several ways that that term Lord is used in Scripture. It's not always used to talk about the divine. Sometimes the word kurios would be used as serve. And the way the woman at the well, she used Lord when she said sir, she used kurios. She was using a term to show polite respect for someone who was a leader, for someone who was a person or official of authority. Usually, you use that word kurios when you talk to a person who is in an official position or capacity. It's like a, a soldier talking to an officer. It was like a servant talking to their master. And sometimes it was used as a title for deity, for God. Now what's interesting in the Septuagint, the Septuagint is, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And when they translated that Greek translation of the Old Testament, when they wanted to translate the covenant name of God, the name Yahweh, they used the Greek word kurios. And it meant sovereign. It meant master. It meant someone having power or authority. And notice this. It meant he to whom a person belongs. He to whom a person belongs, so the power of deciding belongs to him. He to whom a person belongs, so the power of deciding belongs to him. This reminds me of an old story. That I think most of us have probably heard. But I didn't realize that the story was not just a, just a story that goes around like a preacher's story. It was actually something that really happened. And Frank Kosh was the one who told it as being true. And here's what he said. Frank Kosh said many years ago, he said, I never will forget, I was serving on the lead battleship one night. And I was on watch on the bridge, and it was nightfall. The visibility was poor. There was patchy fog. So the captain remained on the bridge, and the captain was keeping an eye on all of the activities. He said shortly after dark, Frank said, the lookout on the wing reported light bearing on the starboard bow. After hearing that, and seeing the light in the distance, the captain told his signal men, signal that ship. Tell them we're on a collision course. I advise you to change course 20 degrees. Back came the signal. I advise you to change your course 20 degrees. That made the captain curious. He sent a message back, change your course 20 degrees. I'm a captain. Back came another signal. You'd better change your course 20 degrees. I'm a seaman, third class John. Who does it? The captain here. So the captain sent a final message. Change your course 20 degrees. I'm a battleship. Back came the flashing light. I'm a lighthouse. Frank said, we changed course. <laughs> so we changed course. Well, what is it about this lighthouse? It's fixed. It's immovable. It's unchanging. The light giver doesn't move to get out of our way. We move. Or we're going to be involved in a collision course to emotional or spiritual disaster. We don't ask the Lord to move. We move. He is the light. We're the ones called in the darkness. Having a Lord means deciding ahead of time who is in charge. But often, you know, we want God, but maybe not too much God. So we wrestle with Him. Just like Jacob did. Yeah, we rely on God, but we often still resist Him as well. He then becomes our adversary. He then becomes our opponent when we do that. Because we live in a world where don't tell me what to do. It's become a motto for so many individuals in our society. I'm free. I can do what I want. I want to decide for myself which way to go. 
Don't tell me what a marriage is supposed to be, that a woman and a man make a marriage. Don't tell me that. We're going to figure out whatever we want to call a marriage, and we'll call it that. Don't tell me what I should watch and what I shouldn't watch online. Don't tell me what I, how I should act or how I shouldn't act on social media. Don't tell me I can't spread this juicy piece of gospel. Don't tell me what I should or should not wear. It doesn't matter what we hear from popular music. It doesn't matter what we see through the media and social media. It doesn't matter what's out there on the internet. It doesn't matter what some celebrity is saying. The final authority for morals, for right and wrong, and everything, and the meaning in our lives is Jesus is Lord. I can't help but be reminded of uh, working with a certain youth group several years ago. I love working with this youth group. It's a great group of kids. But I'm going to tell you, there's this one girl in that group. Do you have an ever-loving last nerve? <laughs> do, do any of you ever have it? Do any of you have that? Do you have an ever-loving last nerve? We do, right? <clears throat> Has anybody been on your ever-loving last nerve? <laughs> some, some of you are testifying out there. You're raising holy hands. And so you're agreeing. This girl got on my ever-loving last nerve. And sometimes she would say things and she would challenge me and I'd have to turn around and I'd go, breathe deeply, don't lash out. Because this is when that this word became popular way back then when I was a youth minister. And she, she had... A double thing she did. If she wanted to challenge you and you told her some word of authority you didn't want to hear, she didn't want to hear, and she wanted to challenge you, she'd say, whatever. And then it didn't stop there. She did an eye roll too. Woo! I had two ever loving last nights, I think she got on. She'd say, whatever, and she did an eye roll. And I'm, Ooh. Ooh. Lord, help me. That's, that's kind of how I felt. And here's the point. Saying whatever to me, that's one thing. You don't say whatever to the Lord. Saying whatever to me, that's one thing. But you and I, we don't say whatever <coughs> to the Lord. <coughs> Who is the person to whom we're listening? Who is the boss of your life? It's not a question of control with God. It has more to do with the fact that He has created us. He's the law of us. So He knows what's best for us. We cannot know everything. So there's always a limit to everything we know. And this God, this law of us, He knows the consequences of taking certain actions and His love seeks to steer us in the right direction. His boundaries, His guidelines, they are for our own good. As a teacher of mine once said, he said, let me tell us all something. He said this, when we come into a relationship with God, God is very clear. He is Lord, end of sentence. His words have stuck with me for all these years. God does not give us a suggestion box for what's right or wrong. There's no room for debate. God's already established that. It's based on who He is. He is the Creator. He is the Logos. And He is not going to debate us over expectations either. In Christianity, you see, here's something I think that is on your handout. Christianity is not about making us slaves to rules. Christianity, the Christian life, is being set free from being slaves to sin. <coughs> The Christian life is about being set free from being slaves to sin. Christianity is less about what God is trying to keep us from and more about what God is trying to get us to become. So His commands are for our own good and for the good of others. And in the process, what do we find? Holiness craves more of God and less of the world. And that's what the Philippian church needed to learn. Now, as much as parents and authority figures hate the word whatever, as 
especially when it's said that way. The phrase I know every single one of you have heard that most people when we're young that we don't like, that we hear in response, that adults, that parental figures, that authority figures will say to young people, the phrase that they don't like, because I, they're very good, because I said so. Because I said so. As one parent joked, he said it's a phrase that makes every child want to cringe and scream because it's an answer that you do not want. Because, you see, here's the thing. It's an answer rooted in authority. And here's what the parent asks. He said, why isn't that enough? Why isn't that enough? Especially, why is that not enough when it comes to a reference to God. Why do we keep trying to negotiate with God? We read a scripture, God has said so, here, here, and here, here. Why do we keep trying to negotiate? Why do we keep trying to find a loophole? Why do we keep trying to resist? Because we want what we want. And if we live our lives doing what we want, Jesus is not Lord. Because then we would be pursuing a life that's all about us. And so why do certain things matter? Why does God want us to behave a certain way? Why is God against certain things like sin? Because God said so. Because God is the authority. Because God wants what's best for us. And He knows the consequences of living a life that follows after sin. The command stands based on His Lordship. Not based on whether or not I appreciate them or even understand them. Because, as you notice the next slide here, Lordship in my life and your life means that you and I understand that a Lord that has the power to give life has the right to give law. He is the law God. He is the Creator. He's got a right to give the law. Because the Lord said so. And because it's who he is. But here's what we have to remember. Because there are ways God wants things done. Because there are ways God wants us to be a certain way. God wants us to act a certain way. Because there are certain lifestyles God approves of and he does not approve of some others. We have to remember this. And this is based off of Ephesians 4.15. What does it say? Speak the truth what? In love. And John Scott, I think he was influenced by that verse and he came up with this quote. Notice what he said. Truth becomes hard if it's not softened by love. And love becomes weak if it is not strengthened by truth. And I think that is worded so well for us. To say that Jesus is Lord, that is saying Jesus doesn't answer to the culture. To say that Jesus is Lord, that says Jesus does not answer to a committee. He doesn't answer to Congress. He doesn't answer to any government or any earthly power or ruler or authority. And he most certainly not, he does not answer to me or to you. Now we would never say in theory, Jesus is just a good teacher. I don't think any of us would, would ever say that. I don't think we would say those words. You know, Jesus, he's just a good teacher among many other good teachers. I don't think we would say that. But here's the issue. Do we act like we believe that by the way that we live our daily lives? Is he really Lord in every part of our life? Do we take him at his word? And so that's something we have to think about. Here's why it's important. Here's why it's important to acknowledge Christ's lordship. Acknowledging Christ's Lordship and acknowledging His direction. It's the only way we can become like Christ. It's the only way we can become more like Christ. It's the only way you see that we develop our spiritual maturity. Because there are times we get stuck in a spiritual rut because something is not being submitted to Christ. When we get to, stuck into a spiritual rut, when we reach a spiritual plateau, that means something is not being submitted to Christ. But we want a closer walk with God. We want to receive His blessings. But we're stuck. So there must be some area in life where we're not surrendering to God. And I want you to answer these 
these three statements. I want you to answer these not only today, but I want you to think about these for the rest of the week. I want to think about them as well, because it really helps us to think about whether or not Jesus really is Lord in our lives as we practice Christianity. So let's think about it. Lord, I'll give you anything except what? How would you answer these? If you're going to answer these privately on your own to yourself, how would you answer them? Is there anything that you would hold back from God? Lord, I'll give you anything. Except I won't give you that. Whatever that is, that's keeping you from making Him Lord of your life. The next one, Lord, I'll do anything. Except I won't do that. God, if you expect me to do that, I won't do that. Then that would be keeping you for making Jesus your Lord. The third one, how would you answer this? Lord, I'll change anything in my life except, except what? However we answer those questions, indicate to us something that stands between us and God. Just think about Abraham. God asked him, I want you to sacrifice your son. Did Abraham fight back? Would, would, would Abraham have been, been attached to his son that he'd been praying so long for? Would he have been a, so happy to have that son? But God, you can have everything, but you can't have Isaac. But no, he was willing. He went there. He was going to do it. And the book of Hebrews tells us, even the point where he believed that God would rise, raise him from the dead if he took Isaac's life. But here's the question. And one teacher said this many years ago. What is your Isaac? Is there anything you would be tempted to hold back from God? Whatever that thing is. God, I'll give you anything except that. I'll do anything except that. I'll change anything except that. What is your Isaac? What is anything that would get in between you and making Jesus your Lord? We need to think on those things. How would you answer those? A professor who taught at a Bible college, he was speaking at a convention. And when his talk was over, a female student came over to him saying that his message had really spoken to her. And he had talked about the Lordship of Christ in his message. And the student said this, she said, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life, but I'm afraid that God might, you know, send me to a mission field or something. And I don't want to go. So the Bible professor, he listened to her with patience and love. And then he opened his Bible to Acts chapter 10 and verse 14. And he talked about how absurd Peter's answer was. You remember that God had given Peter a vision of a sheep that had all kinds of four-footed animals and, and wild beasts and, and creeping things and, and birds of the air. And then a voice came to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. How did Peter respond? Not so, Lord. In other words, no, Lord. Surely not. The professor, he closed his Bible. And he said to the student, he said, a servant never gives orders to his or her master. Now the professor said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this pencil. And I want you to cross out the two words, not so, and leave the word Lord. Or, I want you to cross out the word Lord and leave not so. And he handed her the pencil. And he walked away. And he was letting her know, it's your choice. Are you going to say not so to God? Surely not. Or is he going to be Lord of your life and you're going to say Lord? And so he went off and the professor, he talked to other students from a distance and occasionally he would, he would look back at her and he would notice that she was just looking down at, at her Bible and he could tell she was struggling. And he went over to her after a while 
He came up behind her. He peeked over her shoulder. And he saw that that page in her Bible was filled with tears. But the words, not so, were crossed out in her Bible. Because she made a decision that day. Jesus is my Lord. So, God, I'll give you anything. God, I'll do anything. Lord, I'll change anything. Because Jesus is my Lord. When we think about Scripture, we think about the Great Commission. Remember what Jesus said to his followers? When he spoke the words of the Great Commission, he said, All authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then what did Jesus want done? Go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach, make disciples. But Jesus, he really... He was really the one that made it so abundantly clear in letting us know, if you love me, give me your life. I want everything. And so we think of a passage like this. Luke 6, 46. Jesus said this. Just think on this passage as we close. Jesus said, Now why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. It's one thing to say Jesus is Lord, and that's a great start. But it's another to live that Jesus is Lord. Call me Lord, Lord, and do what I say. What did he say? He wants us to be baptized, to have our sins washed away, to be added to the body of Christ. That's what he wants us to do. Have you done that? You have a perfect opportunity this morning to be baptized for the remission of your sins, to be added to the church, to become a part of the body of Christ. And maybe you've already done that, but maybe as a Christian, maybe you're struggling with lordship in your life. Maybe it's hard for you right now to choose between not so and Lord. Maybe that's a hard thing. I just want you to know this, that we are here to help you, no matter what decision you may be having a hard time making. Know that we're here to help you to do what the Lord wants you to do. If we can help you in any way for Jesus to be your Lord today, why don't you come now as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer.
great to see all of you here today. Again, we'd like to ask that you remember all those that are listed in the bulletin. Uh, continue to remember Steve Aker, uh, Meg Yates, and the loss of her baby cousin. Remember Wilbur Jean, uh, Sister Barbara Hood, and her upcoming procedures. I uh, remember Monica Yacht and the family, uh, and also uh, Todd Parker, Stanton with Church of Christ. I uh, remember all of these. Uh, also, again, Lonnie Jones will be conducting a marriage and family workshop next Sunday, and after services concluded, uh, we will have a brief intermission, and then we'll break off into our discussion groups. A through Q, last names will meet in the large annex over here, and last names R through Z will meet in the back of the auditorium. Uh, there's nothing further to ask or say to this. Let's pray. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now and thank you for this day and your blessings in it. Thank you for this time this morning that you've given us to come together and learn more about your word. Please let's use the things that Brian has taught us this morning to help impact our lives and help impact others as well as your work. So right this time we ask you to be with those who are on the bulletin that are sick, hurt, and lost loved ones. Be with them and pray for them to be your will. And Lord, be with us all as we still are going through this pandemic, dear Lord, and help us recover from it. So right this time we have to depart. We ask you to go with us and be with us and keep us safe. So we shall impress you some of the new prayer. Thank you. 